Good Work Secret 7 by Enid Blyton. It was the week before bonfire night, and the Secret Seven had been meeting in the shed at the bottom of Peter and Janet's garden. They had all brought some old clothes to put on the guy they were going to make for burning on November the 5th. But while they were waiting for Colin to arrive, Jack's mischievous sister Susie had found out that night's password, Guy Fawkes, and tricked her way into the meeting. And as she was always trying to upset their society, they were very cross with her and much to her annoyance, forced her to sit in a corner of the shed and watch them tuck into the delicious spread they had brought with them. Come on, let me go, you horrible lot! Certainly not. You force your way in, so you can jolly well stop and see us all. Password! Guy Fawkes. Sorry I'm late, but I've had an adventure. It might be something for the Secret Seven. Listen. Wait, Jack! Turn Susie out first. Out you go. Susie, come on. <laughs> Willingly. I don't want to be in your stupid secret seven society anyway. What was she doing here? Tell you about Susie later. Now, Colin, what was this adventure of yours? And for goodness sake, talk quietly in case Susie's listening at the door. Whisper, all of you. <coughs> that goes for you too, Scamper. Well, I was coming along to the meeting, and when I got to that clump of bushes at the corner of Beach's Lane, I heard a lot of whispering in them, and then a yell and a groan. Gosh! I shone my torch at the bushes, but someone knocked it out of my hand. Then I heard the sound of running feet, but by the time I picked my torch up and shone it into the bushes, there was nobody there. That was pretty brave. What was going on, do you think? It was a quarrel of some sort, but look what I found in the bushes. This battered old notebook. Gosh, Gosh what, what is, is it? it? What is it? Most of it seems to be in a sort of code. Look, Peter. Hmm. Golly. Could be a list of stolen goods. Silver candlestick. Cigarette box. Four silver cups. Diamond bracelet. Gold ring. It seems we might be onto something. It must be a notebook kept by thieves with a list of stolen property. Does it say anything else? Yes. Here's a scribbled note. It says, Gang meet in Old Workman's Shed, back of Lane's garage, 5 p.m. Wednesday. That's tomorrow. Gosh, we are onto something. Should we tell the police about this? No. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll creep round to that old shed tomorrow night ourselves. And as soon as we see the gang are there, one of us can rush round to the police station while the rest of us keep guard on the shed. Yeah, good, yeah, idea. good idea, brilliant yeah. idea. Yeah. Right, everybody, let's tuck into this spread. <coughs> yes, there's some for you, Scamper. Gosh, we've forgotten all about Susie. And we've been talking at the top of our voices. Scamper, see if she's outside. No, she's not there. You would have growled, wouldn't you, Scamper? Why don't we all stroll up to Lane's garage tomorrow and have a quiet look round? Yes, I know a boy called Larry who works there. I'll ask him if we can have a look at the new cars there. Then we can keep an eye on the shed. Good idea. We'll go there after tea. They all rushed their tea the next night and everyone was at the garage at a quarter to five. They were very excited as they walked with Colin over to speak to Larry. Hello, Larry. Hello, Colin. You lot come to help me? No. Do you mind if we have a look at the cars? Help yourself, so long as you don't touch them. Thanks. Come on then, everyone. That man walking past looks suspicious. Idiot. That's my headmaster. Good thing he didn't hear you. We'll wander about here for a bit, and at five to five, I'll go down the alley to the yard where the shed is. If it's all clear, I'll give a low whistle, and you creep down and join me. They all looked round the cars, and at five to five, Peter went down the alley in the darkness. When he came to the yard where the shed stood, he could hardly contain his delight. 
There was a light in the shed. The gang were there then. If only they could catch the whole lot at once. He gave a low whistle, and the others crept down to join him. Their hearts beat fast as they stared at the shed, with the dim light shining from one small window. Let's creep up and see if we can peep in at that window. Come on, then. I'll stand on those bricks and peep in. I can't see them, but I can hear them. Shall we get the police straight away? We'd better make sure it isn't workmen inside. Was that a gun? Don't grab me like that, Barbara. You nearly made me shout out. I don't know if it's a gun. What's happening in there? I don't know, but I'm going to have a look through the keyhole where the light's coming from. Be careful, Peter. All right. Oh, no! Oh, what is it? What are you doing? It's Susie in there with those idiot friends of hers. Jim and Ronnie and Doris. They're all popping paper bags. It's all a trick. It's Susie. Oh, she's so oh, awful. Rotten. She's oh, rotten, girl. girl. Open that door, Susie. I'm ashamed to have a sister like you. Open up. <laughs> There's seven of us and only four of you. We'll just wait here till you come out. You hadn't thought of that, had you? Oh, yes, we had. But you'll let us go free. You see if you don't. We shan't. You unlock that door. Listen, Jack. This will make a lovely tale to tell at school. The silly old secret seven, tricked by a stupid notebook. They think themselves so clever and think that four children in the shed are a gang of robbers shooting at each other. <laughs> we only had paper bags. <laughs> She'll make everyone roar with laughter about this. We shan't be able to hold our heads up for ages. We'll have to let them go and not sit on them when they come out. We'll have to make a bargain with them. I don't want all the kids at school laughing at me and popping paper bags at me wherever I go. Let's let them go in return for keeping silent about this. You're right, I suppose, Colin. All right, Susie, you win for the present. We'll let you out and won't touch you if you promise solemnly not to say a single word about this to anyone at school. All right. I knew you'd have to make a bargain, you silly old secret seven. We're coming out now, so keep your word. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Thanks for a marvellous show. Let us know when you want another adventure, and we'll provide one for you. See you later, Jack. Susie and her friends went off leaving a very gloomy Secret Seven behind by the shed. And they felt even worse when a policeman came along and told them off for hanging around the dark alley. The next day, Peter and Janet talked and talked about Susie's trick. Even Scamper seemed to know how miserable they felt and tried to cheer them up. They forgot their annoyance later, however, after a marvellous tea of cakes and cream buns and chocolate eclairs at their mother's old nanny's house. In fact, they had such a lovely time there that they almost forgot their father was going to pick them up at six o'clock to take them home. When they heard his car, they ran down the path and climbed into the back. And into the town. I've just got a call at the station for some parcels. I'll leave the car in the station yard with you in it. I shall be a minute. I'll just back in here. Shall be long, you two. All right, Daddy. Don't hurry. We're quite comfy here. I think I'll lay back and have a little sleep. I've eaten too much. I feel the same. <sighs> Janet! Janet, don't speak aloud. Hey? I was half asleep. What's the matter? This... I think this car's been stolen by two men. They don't know we're in the back. I saw the men get in, but in the darkness, I thought it was Daddy who picked up a friend. It slipped down to the floor, so if they turn round, they won't see us. Quick now, for goodness sake! Gosh, I'm frightened, Peter. Don't worry. As long as the men don't know we're here, we're all right. But where are they taking us? I've no idea. We seem to be in a part of town. I don't know. 
Hello, we're stopping. We're all right here. No one about. Get in touch with Q8061 at once. Tell him Sid's place, five o'clock any evening. I'll be there. Right. Ah, curse it. What's up? Oh, I think I dropped something. I thought I heard something fall. Oh, for goodness sake. Well, let's clear out now while the going's good. The police will be on the lookout for this car in a few minutes. I'm going to Sid's, and I don't know anything about you, see? Not a thing. Now, let's get away from here. Both of us. And don't close the doors. We don't want to be heard by anyone. Have they gone? Yes, it's all right, Janet. They won't be coming back. I wonder who they were and why they wanted to come here in a car. I think I'll try and find a telephone box and phone the station to see if Daddy's still there. I'm not going to wait in the car by myself. I wish we had Scamper with us. He would have bought and the men would have taken somebody else's car. Come on, Janet. Let's go and find a phone box. They were lucky. One was at the very corner of the road where they were. They asked someone the name of the road, and Peter slipped into the phone box and dialed the railway station. Their father was most surprised to hear Peter's voice, as he thought the two children were in the car in the yard. Peter explained everything as clearly as he could, and his father listened with amazement. The children returned to the car, and it wasn't long before a taxi drew up alongside, and the children's father jumped out. Here we are, Daddy. Oh, are you two all right? Yes, don't, don't worry. worry. Oh, little did I think my car had been driven away while I was at the station. Are you sure you're all right? Yes. We were both half asleep in the back. The men didn't even spot us. They got in, drew straight to this place, then got out. They hardly spoke to each other. Well, jump in and we'll drive home. I expect there were a couple of young idiots who just wanted to drive here and not walk. Are you going to tell the police, Daddy? No, it's not worth wasting their time. They'll never be able to trace them. And I've got the car back safely. They might be crooks. I don't think so. They'll be caught for something sooner or later if they are. Good thing you had the sense to keep quiet in the back of the car. Next afternoon at three o'clock, all the Secret Seven and Scamper were down in the shed. The oil stove was lit and the shed was nice and warm and the curtains were drawn across the windows. George had had a present of a big bag of giant humbugs and while they were quietly enjoying them, Peter told them the events of the night before. They listened excitedly. Well, if your father is not going to the police about it, then it leaves the field free for the Secret Seven to do something about it. Yes, but I wouldn't know where to begin. Well, I reckon these men are up to something. I don't know what, but I think we ought to find out something about them. Yes, but what are we going to do, Peter? Well, we haven't got much to go on. I'm going to take this humbug out of my mouth while I talk. That's better. No, Scamper. Don't sniff at it. You don't like humbugs. Anyhow, we do have a few clues. One is Sid's place. We ought to try and find out where that is and watch it to see if either of the men go there. We'd have to watch at five o'clock each day. Go on. Then there's Q8061. That might be a telephone number. We know one man had a low-brimmed hat and long hair down to his collar. And when I caught sight of his hand in the lamplight, I was pretty sure the tip of his middle finger was missing. And I noticed the other man had very short hair. And Peter, do you remember he said he thought he'd drop something? Gosh, yes. I'd forgotten that. That's most important. We'll go and look in the car at once. Bring your torches. Scamper darted out into the garden with the seven, and as he didn't bark, they knew that Susie wasn't about. They went into the garage and opened the doors and looked inside. It's no good us looking in the back. The men were in the front. Shine that torch here, Jack. No, nothing there. Let me see. It might be down between the two front seats. Hey, here we are. A spectacle case. But he didn't wear glasses. They could have been his reading glasses. And look, it's got his name inside. And his telephone number. Now we're on to something. 
It says Briggs, Renning 2150. Renning's not far away. We could look the name up in the telephone directory and see his address. Gosh, what a find. Wait a minute. Isn't that a button under the left front seat? Yes, I expect it came off my father's Mac. It must have been there for ages. I'll put it in my pocket. Now let's go and look in the telephone directory. Yes, if there's a Briggs with that number, we can find out his address. So, the Secret Seven, with an excited scamper, went into the house and took the telephone directory from the shelf in the hallway and started to search through it. Right, A, um, B, a B, A, B, E. Oh, here we are, Briggs. There it is, look. Renning, 2150, H-E Briggs, Little Hill, Rains Road, Renning. Right, Mr Briggs, we're coming after you. Renning was about three miles away, and it didn't take long for them to get there on their bicycles. They cycled on to Rains Road, which was really a little lane, set with pretty cottages. Little Hill was at one end, a nice little place with a colourful garden. Well, it doesn't look like the home of a crook, but you never know. There's someone in the garden, Peter. See if you can make him admit that he dropped his spectacle case in your father's car. Right, here goes. Um, good afternoon. Are you Mr Briggs? Uh, yes, I am, young man. Why? Uh, well, have you by any chance lost a spectacle case? Yes, I have lost one. Why, have you found it? Yes. Good. Uh, where was it? In the front of a car. What car? You sound rather mysterious. Losing a spectacle case is quite an ordinary thing to do, you know. It was dropped in my father's car last night. Oh, well, no, it wasn't. You see, I lost that case about a week ago. It can't be mine. I wasn't in anyone's car last night. The case has your name on it. And it was in my father's car last night. Who is your father? I can't quite follow what you are getting at. My father lives at Old Mill House and... Oh, I see. Or oh, you must be Peter, my friend Jack's boy. That explains it. He very kindly gave me a lift last week. I must have dropped the case in his car. I've hunted everywhere for it. And you brought it back. That's very kind of you. Give him my best wishes. Uh, yes, Mr Briggs. Here's your case. It's got your name and address in it. That's how he knew it was yours. Thank you. I imagine one of those interested friends of yours looking over the hedge must be your sister Janet. Look, here's 50 pence for bringing my case back. Buy some chocolate. Share it with your friends. Oh, no. Thank you. I don't want anything. Only too glad to help. Um, goodbye, Mr Briggs. Goodbye. Peter went quickly out of the garden, got on his bicycle and rode swiftly away, the other six following. When they were well away from the place, they all stopped. Phew. I did feel awful when I realised he was a friend of my father's. Daddy's often talking about a friend called Henry who lives at Renning. It must be him. He is H. Briggs. We thought we were so clever too, but we weren't this time. Perhaps the button will be more helpful. Perhaps. But I'm not tackling anyone with buttons that match this one, unless I'm jolly certain he's one of those men. Come on, let's go and have some tea. The next day, they were all invited to Colin's house for tea, and it was decided that afterwards they would make their guy in the old wooden summer house at the bottom of the garden there. So, down they all went, carrying paper, straw, string, and an assortment of old clothes. 
The house had a wooden bench running all round it, and it felt a bit cold. But it was a good secret place to talk at the bottom of the dark garden. A candle was stuck in a bottle and lit, and as there was no shelf to put it on, Colin stood it in the middle of the floor. Mind Scamper doesn't knock that candle over. Where is he? In the kitchen with Daddy, hoping to get some scraps. Right, let's have a meeting first, and then make the guy. Let's forget about the silly mistake over the spectacle case and do a little more work on our adventure. Does anyone know where Sid's place is? Never heard of it. Perhaps Larry at the garage might know. It sounds like the sort of place lorry drivers would use. Good idea. Right, Colin. You and George try and find out something from Larry tomorrow. Now, what about that number one of the men had to get in touch with? Q8061. It might be the letter Q, or spelt K-E-W. Yes, you're right. It could be a Q telephone exchange number. You and Barbara make it your job to find out. What about that button? I'm sure it belongs to my father's Mac, but we'll make sure. Janet, will you see to that, please? And look at Dad's Mac. If he's got one missing, just check that this one matches the others. Now that's the end of the meeting. Let's get on making this guy. They all knelt on the floor and started to sort everything out. Then they began to stuff straw and paper into a big pair of trousers and an old blue jacket. It was difficult to see what they were doing with only the light of a candle. As they worked, they heard the sound of a bark and the scampering of feet. Scamper had been let out of the kitchen door and was coming to find his friends. He rushed straight into the little summer house. You idiot, Scamper! You've knocked the candle over! Grab it, someone! Quick! Look out, Pam! Look out, Barbara! It's set the straw alight! Stamp on it, everybody! That's no good! Get some water, quick, or the whole house will catch fire! <coughs> There's a pond outside and some buckets over here. Come on, everybody! Quick, before the fire spreads! It's a horrible smell. Good job your father can't see it. He'd be furious. Still, I think we've got it under control now. We're lucky the place didn't burn down. Ugh, that smoke. The bench is a bit charred and everything is black and wet. We'd better all come over tomorrow and help clear up. Gosh, I was frightened. Bother, Scamper. Where is he? Gone home at 60 miles an hour. And look. Our poor old guy's completely burnt. We'll have to make another one. It was a gloomy company of children that made their way home. In fact, they were gloomy for the next two days, particularly as Pam and Barbara had found out that there was no such telephone number as Q8061. However, at their Monday meeting, Colin cheered them all up by telling them that Larry had told them that Sid's place was a scruffy-looking eating place at the corner of Old Street and James Street. At five minutes to five, Peter went there and lolled against the corner, watching everybody who went in and out of the cafe. They were mostly men with barrows of fruit which they left outside, or van drivers, or shifty-looking men, unshaved and dirty. Just after five o'clock, Peter had a shock. Hey, you kid, what are you doing hanging around here? Don't you dare take any fruit off my barrow. I know your sort. Now push off before I call the police. I wouldn't dream of taking your fruit. Wouldn't you? Well, what are you standing around for and looking about? Look, me and my mates have been watching you from inside Sid's. We know you're after something. I'm not after anything. What are you hanging around for, then? Well, um, I... Well, I, I... <laughs> push off. And don't let us see you lolling around here again. Understand? With his face burning red, Peter ran back to Colin's house to tell him what had happened. Jack and George were there too, doing their homework. After he had finished his story, Peter sat down looking very miserable. I can't go and watch there anymore. That man was really nasty. How can I watch without being seen? Can't be done. Give up. It's something we just can't do. Come on out to the summer house and see what I've made. We've cleared up all the mess from the fire, and I've got something to show you. Josh, it's a guy. What a beauty. 
He is good, isn't he? Especially as I didn't have many old clothes left. He looks good slumped in that wheelbarrow, doesn't he? What a pity he can't wait outside Sid's place. Nobody would suspect or bother about him. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what about me dressing up as a guy and wearing a mask with eye holes? And one of you taking me somewhere near Sid's calf? There are heaps of guys about now, and nobody would dream our guy was real. That's a brilliant idea. Super. Smashing. When shall we do it? Tomorrow. I can rush over and dress up here. And you can wheel me off in the barrow. What a game. Yes, and I forgot to tell you, Janet says there is a button missing off your dad's Mac. But it's a small sleeve one, and not the same colour as the one you found. Good. That means it probably was a button from that man's Mac. Now I just hope they can find out what Q8061 means. The next evening, all the Secret Seven and Scamper went to see Peter dress up as the guy. He really did look good. He wore an old pair of patched trousers, a ragged jacket and a great big pair of boots. He had a scarf round his neck and a big hat over a wig made of black wool. <laughs> you look dreadful. Put the mask on now. All right. How do I look? <coughs> All right, Scamper. It's only Peter. You do look horrible, Peter. No one would know you're alive. I'll get into the wheelbarrow. Gosh, it's a bit hard. I'll put some cushions under you and an old rug over you. There. Comfortable? Good. Now flop like a real guy. <laughs> 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 Janet, you take Scamper back with you. All right. There's only one thing. Mother doesn't like the idea of children going out with guys and begging for money. That's all right. She won't recognise me. And if we do get any money, we'll give it to charity. Right. Off we go. And no moving about now, Peter. The boys took off, taking turns at wheeling Peter in the barrow, and at last arrived at Sid's cafe, where they placed the barrow in a position from where Peter could see everyone who went in or out. The three boys stood by waiting to see if Peter recognised anyone. If he did, he was to give a sign. Penny for the guy? Oh, that's a good guy. Here's 50 pence for some fireworks. Thank you. Really, we are collecting for charity. Oh, that's nice. Gosh, here's a policeman coming. That's all right. Hello, boys. That's a good guy you've got there. Thank you, officer. He's gone. Hey, look at that guy. His boots are better than mine. Let's take him off him then. Ouch, he kicked me. Who did? That guy, he's kicked me. He's haunted. Quick, let's get going. Colin, can't you look after me better? Heave me up on the cushions a bit. That ruffian pulled me off. Anyway, you've made quite a bit of money. People think you're good. What's the matter? That man by the window, with the hat and the long hair. He looks like the man in the car. The one blowing his nose. Yes. And he's got half a finger missing. That's him. There's a man with a mat gone up to him. And he's got a button missing at the front. Look. They're going into the cafe. Right through into the back room. Listen, the next move is very important. When they come out, try and hear what they're saying. If they go off, Jack and George, shadow them if you can. And Colin, you wheel me home. Shh. They're coming out already. Listen, we might hear anything they say. Yeah, no good wasting time with Sid. No, he said 200 and now it's only 50. Better go and tell Q, he'll be wild. It wasn't worth me coming out of hiding yet till me hair's grown. Come on, let's go to Q. I'm not walking all that way. Let's take that car over there. We can hide it at Q's when we get there. All right, come on. Get that number, Jack. I've got it. PLK 100. Quick, wheel me back to the shed as fast as you can, and we'll decide what to do when we get there. It wasn't long before they were whispering the password outside the shed at the bottom of Peter's garden. The barrow was shoved into some bushes, and Peter had taken off his mask. Pam gave a little scream as he walked in, still looking very peculiar in his woolly wig and ragged clothes. 
The girls listened in silence as Peter related all that had happened. I think the short-haired man has either just come out of prison or escaped from it. He may have committed a robbery before he went in, and he and this other man are trying to sell the proceeds to Sid. Well, who's Q? Where does he come in? Ah, if we could find out who Q is and where he is, he is the missing link. I know, I know. Why can't we look up all the names beginning with Q in our local telephone directory? There can't be all that number of Qs. We can go down the list and anyone with the number 8061 will be our Q. That's a very good idea, Pam. Why didn't we think of that before instead of messing about with K-E-W? Let's go up to the house and look in the directory now. Come on. Here we are. Q. No, there's not very many. Queen, 6543. Quelling, 4322. Quinton, 8061. That's it. Bar's Warehouse, East End. That's at the other end of the town. Gosh, a warehouse. Just the place to hide stolen goods. That was a good idea of yours, Pam. All right, Mother, I'll answer it. Oh, it's a policeman. Hello. I've just been to Jack's house and they said you were here. I saw Jack and another boy tonight in Old Street and not long afterwards a car was stolen from near there. I wondered if either of you saw anything suspicious while you were there. Oh, come in, officer. Come in. We can tell you a lot about the thieves and probably even where you'll find the car. The policeman went into the hall, looking extremely surprised. Peter's mother and father both came and joined them. What's all this? Nobody's got into trouble, surely? No, Daddy. You must listen to our story. It's super. Oh, we'd better all come into my study, then. I think you'll find that stolen car, PLK 100, outside Bar's warehouse. You'll also probably find a Mr Quinton and quite a lot of stolen goods on the premises. And you'll find a man with half a finger missing and another who looks like an escaped prisoner. Wait a minute. We are looking for a man with half a missing finger. Fingers, he's called. He's a friend of a well-known thief who escaped from prison last week. They met each other at Sid's calf, and we know where they've gone. Good gracious. They have a friend called Q. They mentioned his telephone number, 8061. And we looked it up and found the address. Then the whole story came out. How they found Sid's place, how Peter dressed up as a guy, how they saw the man with the half finger, and how they saw them steal the car. Everything. When they had finished, the policeman took off his helmet and wiped his brow. Amazing. Incredible. And do these kids do this kind of thing often? <laughs> well, they do keep poking their nose into all sorts of things. <laughs> I don't know that I really approve, but they have done some good work. Mm. We're the Secret Seven, you see, and we really do like some sort of adventure. Oh, hmm. Well, thank you very much. I'll be in touch. I hope you have a good firework night. You deserve it. Hmm. Well, good night. Good night. Good night. Janet, Go and telephone everybody's mother and tell them they're here and we'll get something nice to eat. Oh, thank oh, you, thank you. Thank you. Soon they were all sitting down to potted meat sandwiches, oatmeal biscuits, apples and hot cocoa, talking 19 to the dozen, with Scamper tearing round their legs under the table after titbits. The telephone suddenly rang and Peter went to answer it and soon came racing back to the others. That was the policeman. The police went to the warehouse the stolen car was there. And Mr Quinton. Have they got fingers? And the escaped prisoner? Yes. They were hiding in the cellar. They found all the stolen goods hidden there too. The policeman said it was a wonderful raid and thanked us very much. Good old Secret Seven! We'll have a wonderful firework party tomorrow and Colin's guy will look down on us from the top of the bonfire. Shall we put you up there instead, Peter? You'd look even better. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd rather watch the guy than be one. Although it was rather exciting being a guy, just for one night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. 
they did have a wonderful firework party. And there were no problems, because they all remembered the firework safety code. The adults stored and handled all the fireworks, and even Scamper enjoyed it, because he was tucked away nice and safe indoors. <laughs>